every year we're going to start doing uh, images of some of the big f shows and films that we worked on in the previous year uh, or that year. Um, you can, I don't know if you recognize some of these, but that's the Demogorgon from Stranger Things. Uh, Wonder Woman uh, worked on that and, uh, and Planet of the Apes and uh, Pirates of the Caribbean. There was a ton of other shows uh, last year that were worked on, but these are kind of the big highlights. Um, so we just, we're ending up doing these pieces of art for each year that we work on these iconic characters. So this year is going to be, you know, uh, Wrinkle in Time and uh, a bunch of other cool projects. But I'm going to start a reel um, just to kind of give you a flavor of the different things I've done and the company's done over the last year or so. Thank you. Yeah, this is um, uh, just a filmography of uh, just a la few of the, the projects we've worked on. Um, luckily, I mean, unfortunately, that was a little dark, but uh, hopefully you saw most of it. Um, so, but I'm going to talk about, like, my, I started, like I said, I moved uh, to California from Texas, and, um, uh, but before then, even, um, um, this is way before getting in the film industry, I started off, uh, you know, really being inspired by, um, you know, illustrations, movies, and um, had a s my father had this great Super 8 camera that was, um, that c you could rewind, so I learned how to do visual effects way back in the 70s. So this is an Im image of me in the 70s uh, on a, you know, a little um, uh, Super 8, and I was able to, uh, you know, rewind it, put some, you know, do some interesting effects by putting tape on one side, shoot a building, and then take put tape on the bottom of the, where the building ended and had the roof and peeled it off and did some weird creature running around on top of it. And uh, unfortunately that was with the kind of, uh, you know, technology way back then, but it was actually very exciting. And there was something exciting too about waiting to get it developed and seeing if you screwed up or not. Um, now there's like a, there a, lo a lot of, s you know, instant gratification, but there was something about that whole thing way back then that um, I enjoyed just, you know, waiting f to see if I actually did something good or not. Um, most of the time it was crap, but it was, I learned a lot, which, uh, which was w the real thing. Um, this is me when I was, uh, d used to do a bunch of little paintings. I wanted to be an illustrator when I was a kid, um, but it was very, you can see I love Star Wars. Um, again, this is, you know, this is probably around the 80s, uh, early 80s at that point. And uh, eventually, after high school, I moved out to um, California and, um, was able to work on a um, almost instantaneously work on a movie called From Beyond, 
And um, there's two different hairstyles here you can see. Well, one, one's at the beginning uh, when I started spiking my hair and then it really got into the 80s where we had the mullet. Um, and uh, so that was Fright Night 2 and this is From Beyond, which is a H.B. Lovecraft film. Um, but what's fantastic about that was that there was, um, uh, it was a time in the 80s that's a lot like it is now uh, with CG. Um, that there was a lot of different people doing makeup effects and it was all over California. People were doing it out of their garage, their house. It was just everywhere. It was kind of a fantastic time. And, uh, and there was no you know, technical things you had to learn really. You just understood kind of the basic uh, premise of you know, building, building some kind of a creature. Um, but on this first job I learned so much and I was stuck for uh, most of my career, uh, at least for tw almost 20 years of doing it and uh, worked on Gremlins 2. Uh, for Rick Baker. This is uh, the first project. Uh, Rick Baker is an Academy Award winning makeup effects artist that's retired, but he at, as in his highlight uh, days, the, the, um, he did American Werewolf in London and some you know, uh, fantastic things that won him some Academy Awards, and I, I learned so much from him. And um, I was w one of his lead painters at the time, and this is just one of the gremlins where I was like, uh, you know, there was this interesting aspect of learning how to paint with. Um, opaque materials too. So all these things were made of polyfoam. There was, this was before silicone even. Um, and uh, so there was no translucency. So we learned how to actually paint and make translucency out of doing layers. And it was actually kind of a cool, fantastical time of being creative with the limitations we had back then. Um, I also worked on Nutty Professor, worked on the grandma makeup, uh, and uh, Men in Black. Um, so Men in Black was a lot of fun because I had been working for Rick for a lot of long time and I'm such a sci-fi geek. You know, sci-fi was like my favorite. I loved horror and I loved sci-fi, but, um, and uh, it seemed like a lot of the projects we were doing were very cool, like Nutty Professor, but they were all, c you know, comedies or, but this Men in Black was like kind of like the reason I kind of got in the business was, you know, to create aliens and create monsters. And so this was, was a really fun project. and. Um, I ended up uh, designing and creating uh, the Worm Guys, um, and this was kind of an interesting uh, little, um, uh, you know, thing that was a background character originally. We we had all these main characters uh, that we were designing for, um, that were in the script, and the Worm Guys weren't in the script. They were just, uh, I was Rick Baker said, hey, there's this one scene where there's all these aliens walking around, like in, um, you know, uh, in this one area, and um, can you help design, you know, some of the aliens. So I designed these worm guys. I had the, the idea that they were actually about eight feet tall, um, but I did this clay maquette that was only the size they are now. The and the director came by the, uh, the studio and saw all the different designs. And at this time we designed um, actually in clay. So people could physically, the director could walk around and see you know, the design. When he saw these, he was like, oh wow, what is this? And I kind of explained it, you know, being eight feet tall and what they do. And he goes, no, 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 that's wrong. They're that size. And we need to make some scenes for them. So I helped uh, come up with this whole kitchen scene. Uh, and it was a blast, too. I ended up having to, because these characters smoke cigarettes, um, which are really bad for you, by the way. <laughs> but, uh, but um, and they were really bad because I actually was in the, the behind it, actually smoking um, a, uh, a, some kind of a, uh, cigarette or whatever it was at the time, but blowing smoke out of one of their mouths so that it looked like they were smoking. It was, but it was a lot of fun puppeteering that and working on that project. Um, after that, it was working on the Grinch that stole Christmas, and um, you can see my hair has changed. Actually, yeah, this is I'm going to go through the different hairstyles. So, <laughs> the w the w the one before that, oh, it's up. Oh, sorry, I went a little too far. Oh well. So that was getting into the 90s. This is a uh, um, 90s. I had the long hair, you know, you can see in right here. So, um, sorry to bore you with my hair talk, but. When I was going through these photos, I, I forgot how many different hairstyles I had. Um, okay, so the next thing uh, was right around 2000, and this is, I was actually, uh, before then, it was a Jurassic Park was the one thing that influenced me, and I, I'm sure influenced a lot of you, you people that are interested in CG at that time, as it was a, a big breakthrough in the industry. Most of my colleagues that I was working with at the time, at Rick Baker's, and um, they were, you know, traumatized. They were thinking, oh my God, this is the death of us, you know, it's like, and I said, no, this isn't, this is a great way to like, what we know evolve into something really cool. Um, a lot of people, unfortunately, don't feel that way. People are afraid of change. And um, I've always embraced change. I think to be stagnant, you know, is a lack of growth, you know, to be able to 
have something that challenges you know everything that you know to push you to the next level I think is exciting and so I embraced it and uh, I was extremely excited uh, about the possibilities at that time um, so I started educating myself and I ended up using soft homage uh, 3d at that time because I, I found out like that was one of the softwares that ILM used to create the dinosaurs in Jurassic Park and um, and then I started at um, uh, Stan Winston's and Stan was another makeup effects house that actually did work on Jurassic Park but did the animatronic dinosaurs and um, I was brought on because I told him I'm, I'm, I'm out of makeup effects but I'd love to work with you but I'm gonna you know uh, only want to work on CG so he basically said well I, I started digital domain with James Cameron that got too big I'd like to do a little small in-house visual effects company and if you'd like to run that then you know go go for it so I actually I didn't know enough. I was just like, you know, a lot of ways I was bullshitting at the time, like, yeah, I'm going to do this. I know everything. It's like, uh, so then I had to find the, the people that actually on the technical level that actually could really push, you know, the technical aspects of what we really needed. Um, but, but even before that happened, we did, I was able to convince him about getting two computers with soft homage on them. And uh, I started to do some like little test uh, for like a promo piece for him. Um, and then this job came in, uh, AI, Steven Spielberg's AI, and um, there was a lot of different people working on that. Uh, ILM was working on it, uh, and um, we were working on it at stands, and because um, there was going to be a lot of practical robots having to be built. Um, I ended up starting to draw, just doing it um, kind of traditional, because that's what I, I knew at the time, and um, doing Photoshop illustrations. And uh, ILM was doing the same thing. Um, and Stan Winston came in one day and he said, hey, these computers that you actually just purchased, these animation computers, I want you to stop using a, a sketchbook or any of that. I want you to use these to design these robots. And this is, a, it sounds, you know, like, oh, well, that makes sense. But at that time, it really didn't. At that time, there was no one doing this um, because it was really, there was no ZBrush. There was none of this that was out there that we have today to design with. It was strictly a animation package. So... Um, he, he challenged me and I was like, well, okay, well, he's, he's the one paying me to do this, so I'll, I'll figure it out, I guess. Um, and, you know, it was one of those things that I had no idea what I was, you know, in for. And I was excited once I realized that it was endless. Once I got into it, this is the, this is the days of, I don't know if everybody knows what NURBS are, but this is before polygons, but NURBS were what Softimage used at the time for building a lot of the characters and uh, models. And uh, what they... NURBS basically um, had their own kind of UVs already built into them for the most part, so you didn't have to spend that much time, like, you know, having to do a... Uh, it, w it was a little messy in some ways, but it was, it was an organic quality to it. But what I, well for a design tool, especially doing something like this, I was able to do a bunch of different designs really quick and also texture it really quick. And part of it, like, it was very experimental. Like, these lines that you see on this were after I did, like, three or four different textures. I just, uh, you know, took a picture of something and a piece of metal or something else. But then I went out and I took a picture of my headlight on my car. And I thought, well, is there some, an interesting pattern there? And actually that, the whole ribbing on it is actually the headlight of my car. And, uh, and I was like, well, that's fantastic. I had no idea it would look that cool. And in the movie, it's, you know, ILM had to actually replicate that. So it was, it was kind of a fun time for me as a des designer because it allowed me to actually try something um, in a way that's more like experimental opposed to overthinking something, you know, and a lot of times as artists we s tend to overthink, you know, a design so we spend a lot of time going, okay, wait, this has to be this way because we're thinking technically. So this, this software actually allowed me to open up as a designer in ways that I never imagined and it is part of, you know, my pipeline right now. Um, not soft homage, unfortunately, because they went away, but Obviously, the CG and uh, has changed with all the different softwares like ZBrush and um, Keyshot. But so a lot of these, um, this is just some of the clips from the movie. All these characters were designed, you know, uh, in the same manner. So that was using Soft Homage, um, and these are the designs that were done early on. So this a lot of them seem very primitive right now. I mean, it's one of those. The original one that the the specialist is what they called that one that looked like an alien. Um, that was the first one, and that's just the m one I had the most fun on. A lot of these were just like one-offs, you know, they were going to be background characters, but they ended up being, you know, characters throughout the, or, or at least in the film, that we actually had to physically build. Oh, sorry, went a little too far. Um, so, yeah, this was 
uh, one of the designs, and then this is us physically building it um, as puppets. So we'd end up using some of this, uh, at least for the sculptors, to influence what they were building. And then the, the excitement came on the next project uh, that we worked on. Let me go back. Uh, was uh, Terminator 3. So I was still using Soft Image, um, and ended up uh, designing, in the same kind of manner, designed uh, the TX, which is the female um, uh, villain in the film, and also the uh, T T1000. Uh, and um, these were both done in the uh, computer, but this is the first time we started using uh, 3D printing. And uh, I found that just fascinating. Um, we ended up printing these, uh, these characters, you know, especially the TX, the, the head. There was a lot of these parts that had to be printed. So none of it was sculpted, it was all 3D printed. This, was, uh, this, char this one was designed, um, and we ended up using the, the model to uh, do this. Um, it, was, uh, a, a, it was milling. Opposed to 3D printing, it was actually milling it out of foam. Um, but it was fascinating because for me, um, to actually be able to touch something again that I actually created was exciting because that was the one thing in the computer, you know, we take for granted. There's, you know, it's just, it's there. We don't, you know, if you don't know if, what does it look like if you can't walk around it, if there's some weird, you know, shape that you didn't see in the sculpture, uh, in the computer because you're dealing with computer cameras a lot of times. So to see things and then realize, wow, it, it, it actually looks quite a bit different physically. Um, so that was, uh, that was kind of the, uh, the design phase of, um, and the makeup effects and uh, getting into CG originally as a design tool. And then in 2005 is when I started my company, ASC. Um, and uh, the, the company was just founded with me. I left stands because I thought, well, I'm going to take a break. It's a weird time in the industry because makeup effects was having a very big lull, but CG wasn't really booming, um, uh, but it was starting to. So it was kind of a transitional time. And I was actually taking this break I took was to go back to my roots of being just a designer. So I ended up designing um, uh, for a lot of projects. Uh, the studio needed the help, um, and I found that, wow, this is the perfect time for me to get into this part of the industry because there's a script that talks about a creature, but they, this, the studio doesn't know if it's a guy in a suit, a puppet, or a visual effect. So they don't want to go to those, those houses and them start designing or build it without having someone else that's outside of that design it. So that's what I was hired to do and um, was able to work on some, uh, you know, really fun projects, you know, like um, Incredible Hulk. Um, and so this was, you know, one of the first projects. The first project was uh, I Am Legend. Uh, then there was a Mummy 3 and then there was, uh, but after a while I started getting so many of these projects that it became uh, way too much for me just to handle. So I ended up starting to, you know, bringing some artists in some were remote at first, and then it became like, uh, you know, an entire group. And it started small. It was only like five of us. And then eventually it became, you know, 10. And now we're at, you know, 35. Um, and, uh, and we're expanding. You know, it's like we actually have a, um, uh, we're going to be expanding into China and ca uh, Canada, and hopefully one day here. Um, so this is a, uh, um, you know, this is uh, Ninja Turtles, and so this is just kind of showing you like the design, the models, and what we've really um, started doing quite a bit because now we're, we, we got beyond the, um, the, just the design aspect is we started building assets, and assets for doing previs, which we were doing quite a bit of, and also visual effects. And, uh, we sl and as we were going, we'd use these models um, to help you know, the, the industry, you know, use them for anything they needed, but it also helped see the design from many different angles. Um, and then uh, this was a dream come true. So one of my favorite films besides Star Wars when I was growing up was Planet of the Apes, the original one with Charlton Heston. And um, when this job came about uh, early, this I've been wor I'd, I'd worked on these for, a, this last one just came out like a year ago, but I had been working on it for almost eight years of all these. And, um, Started off with uh, Rise of the Planet, or yeah, Rise of the Planet of the Apes, and that was almost a year of designing. And uh, this was before Weta was involved. It was not; no one knew exactly what it was going to be. This is going back into that: is this going to be a guy in a suit? Maybe it's uh, a hybrid approach, or maybe it's some other company that's done a lot of these animals, like um, Rhythm and Hughes was, you know, kind of in the the works a little bit. Um, but what it, they really needed is a design to figure out what this character Caesar the main ape would look like. 
And um, so we spent so much time. The, the, the writer, or the original writer on the project, which was going to be the director, um, and it, it wanted to try so many different looks. I'm, I'm only showing you the final, and I'll talk about what we actually came to, but it was like, it was hundreds of designs. We did everything from putting, like, cartilage, since he was supposed to be slightly mutating into more human, um, something we could relate to. We tried everything to make it look like there was a humanity behind it. And, um, but then it lost its, uh, the fact that it was a primate or a chimpanzee. So it was going back to a chimpanzee. What is a chimpanzee? Um, ma what did we want to maintain? And it was everything on a chimpanzee. We wanted to maintain every aspect of it except for where the mouth was. So the mouth, as you can see on the chimpanzees, are very low. Um, they're, they, they hang. Um, so we actually brought that up to where the human mouth would be. And then the other was just changing out the eyes to be more human. Everything else, and a bit of the posture, a little bit too, that was another aspect of it. But for the most part, every part of the face, the nose, all that stuff, the ears, were all just to be, you know, just let's stick with a chimpanzee. But find a chimpanzee that we, you know, can identify with. So, and this was the final one that we uh, um, went with. And then um, from all the different ones, this is the characters from the last movie, War of the Planet of the Apes. And part of it was to make them feel like every time you saw an ape, you, you, you can identify with them so they wouldn't get lost in the mix. So there's so many. We had an albino uh, winter. You had uh, all these different characters. Um, and only one was clothed, and uh, that was Bad Ape. And uh, Bad Ape was, the reason he was clothed is he was, he was in the, um, uh, the art, he was kind of in the snowy um, area, and he had no fur on him. So, and he was kind of skinny and pathetic, so he needed to stay warm. Um, but it was interesting because I'm not showing you all the designs of all the, the other characters because they were all, by this time, they were going to be all clothed because they wanted to, in the Charlton Heston one, they did have clothing um, and they wanted to start uh, bringing those clothes in into the, uh, the kind of their culture. It just started looking goofy and it looked like you just put clothes on a chimpanzee or an ape and, and, uh, and looked like, you know, j it just didn't work except for the one that you wanted it to be kind of funny with, um, which was Bad Ape. Um, but what we did find is that one to, with the clothing too was an aspect of creating culture with them. So it looked like they were apes that had been around for a while that, that they weren't just, you know, um, animals, but they actually had a culture and you could, we could identify with them. And a lot of it was putting war paint on them and jewelry and, you know, other things that made them feel unique. Um, and then we ended up doing a lot of keyframes. Uh, keyframes are, are a key moment of the, the film. And uh, this is like a moment when they come across some dead humans and they were shot by the, the person that Caesar's um, chasing down to get revenge. And um, so a lot of these are early on days, like when we actually do these paintings, they're, you know, when the script is being written and we're actually helping the process of how that, that is going to be composed, does that work or not, or do they have to rewrite it? So a lot like what I was talking about with the designs to create like the creatures, if it's going to be CG or practical, this is also falls in the same thing is like, is this work in the script before they actually go out and shoot it? Does it help tell that story? And so we end up doing that quite a bit. We do it uh, like Wonder Woman. We did quite a few of the key scenes for that as well to help tell a story. This is when she first comes to um, London and um, and it's, you know, it's a new world for her and, and how do we want to see her? And there's a little bit of her costume like sneaking through. So those kind of things were the, the aspect that um, Patty Jenkins, the director, really wanted to see and it helped convey it. And when you see the movie, this is, you know, in the movie. So it's those things kind of help her tell her story. We also, on Wonder Woman, besides a lot of key scenes and some of the other characters that I'm not going to get into because there was um, limited time, is this uh, history scene. The history scene was when um, Wonder Woman was being told by um, her mother about how they came about. And it was this big, vast uh, book that opened up, and it was all these, um, you know, aspects of their life uh, and dealing with humans and how humans dealt with, you know, enslaved uh, them, enslaved them, and how they broke out of that and, uh, and how they, you know, kind of went on their own. Um, so all these paintings needed to be... Um, it's almost in a classical way, Patty really wanted to embrace kind of not an, uh, a CG or um, Photoshop quality to the um, painting, but have it more kind of like classical in a lot of ways, like um, have uh, like an old oil painting that's telling an old story. Um, and so we had all these um, 
different um, artists from the past that you know she was identifying with, and there was a combination of many. And um, you know, so all these had you know was looking at like uh, artwork too, because a lot of um, modern um, uh, art basically has like you know really harsh shadows and um, uh, you know harsh key lights and, and rim lights, and uh, the uh, she wanted that real soft kind of quality that you see in some of the old classical paintings. And uh, these were brought to life digitally so that they had dimension. Um, Independence Day, this is um, the, uh, the sequel to the original Independence Day. Um, we ended up working on that for a while, helping design aspects um, all over, like the, the ship that lands on the Earth, um, the aliens. This is the queen alien uh, outside of her like suit. All these aliens had suits that they were wearing. Um, but this is getting, you know, again, the 3D that was created as a design and then used as an asset that uh, later on, and I'll show you here in a bit, how we took it to a new level of just design to help tell, like, you know, the story of uh, do how do these characters work, you know. Part of when you're designing abstract aliens and robots and characters, you know, doing these um, kind of motion studies, which I'll show you here in a bit, help um, make sure that that design is, is solid and doesn't fall apart. Um, because what happens a lot too in in uh, in film a lot of times is that these um, uh, a lot of the characters are designed then they don't go through this process of really going all out and figuring out if this, this does this character actually function or and they find out later on they have to redesign it because it wasn't it didn't go through all the proper process of design through motion studies to even previs and this is uh, we we did a lot of previs on. Um, on this film, but this was one of the earlier like just scenes where we're trying to figure out like how this big uh, mammoth Oh, that's weird. Why is it doing that? Just advance to Sorry, this is it has a delay here on this one All right, so this is the previs of the Queen chasing um, This this bus and it was just to try to figure out how how it would turn how it actually would maneuver You know for scale. So this is just early uh, early days of that and then, then we got into um, other motion studies. So this was uh, these um, these were just some of the other aliens. These were like the colonist and how they would walk, you know, with their guns, how their tentacles would move. Um, this was a, a called a soldier, which was a lot bigger. How his gun would deploy, how that gun would actually function, how his tentacles would work. And then this was like a, a 3D um, turntable of the queen's. Uh, you know, with in her suit, her suit of armor, and then this shows how her weapon would deploy from underneath, and then just become a Gatlin gun. So all these were kind of like very helpful for um, the director to you know make sure that it's you know going in the right direction. So Stephen King's Mist was another project that we worked on. Um, is it was, th it was uh, the not the w the movie, but the TV show, and it was um, uh, a, a network that actually was bought out by. Paramount, but we worked on the first season and um, ended up doing these. Uh, basically, this is a process where they shot something. Um, it was these the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, and um, they ended up shooting a practical, and it didn't work out. the The uh, showrunner basically said, "You know, I this is not what I imagined. Yeah, this is not even the angles I like." So he came to us and said, "Can you polish it up?" And he, we and he, we asked, "It's like, well, what do you want?" to be polished. He goes, well, can you make them look better? And it's like, well, that's... Th so we ended up uh, saying, okay, well, we w walked through like everything he wanted and ended up designing it and uh, doing these um, uh, keyframes or, or uh, storyboards of the, of the actually um, scene that was actually going to take place. And uh, he, you know, it was extremely helpful, helpful for him and ended up doing this key art or this uh, concept art of uh, the different four horsemen. The original um, concept, uh, or the, the ones, the practical ones, they all kind of looked the same. You know, and part of us was to kind of make each one look drastically different and kind of tell their own story. So when he saw those design, he actually said, this is, this is great, you just go forward. We only had four weeks to do this from the time we actually started. And so we had to design this. And when we design a lot of times, we, if we're always thinking ahead in, in the design process, is like, this may be a visual effect project for us, or or it may be for someone else, so why don't we actually design it? Because we have a pipeline that actually is fairly quick for designing, and it helps execute the idea to a director um, if they 
you know, as a final piece opposed to just a, a really rough painting or a sketch. Um, so this ended up, once he greenlit the, f the fact that we were going to do it, we committed to, you know, building those assets and funneling, you know, them into something that was actually functional and then rigging them and animating them. And so this is a, just a quick little breakdown of, uh, of the um, scene and how they were, each one was kind of built. And not that much time went into this. Again, it was like, you know, just uh, it was a few artists that worked on this and it was four weeks and these characters had to do quite a bit. So it was, it was quite challenging, but, uh, but this is just all the different layers. The whole thing was, he basically said, hey, could you use you know, some of the plates that we gave you? And it's like, no, we're going to start from scratch because he wanted different angles. So we ended up having to create this from scratch. And then, uh, let's see, is there another one? Yeah, so this just kind of goes through. Oh, let me get back. I wanted to show it to you just kind of without the whole breakout so you can kind of see it. This is a strange delay. I don't know why. There it goes. So, yeah, we had to end up doing, like, you know, the mist, which was, that was, a, it's strange because you would think, okay, the mist, it's, it's not that, that difficult, but it was like they were so particular about the mist. You know, in four weeks, we had to figure out and kept changing the mist, and, and it was just insane. It was like, well, let's just get the horses right. And they kept wanting the, the horses, all the horses' heads to move. You know, it was like each one to do something. It was like, okay, he's just adding movement just so that there's movement. Um, but it was actually a fun challenge for us. You know, it was just, uh, you know, to be able to, you know, crank that out in four weeks and, you know, have a bit of fun with it. Um, so this brings me to uh, that process also is kind of, and uh, Stranger Things and a few other projects I'm going to show you are this thing that we actually branded at ASC is the sketch to screen. And it's a process that um, doesn't really exist that in, in the industry that well. It's, there's, it's, it's so fragmented in the industry, unfortunately, and it's been this way for a long time. And what we're trying to do is bring that clarity all the way through um, to where if this is all the way from a script, you know, we're sketching the, the characters, the worlds, the creatures, and everything that has to do with it. Oh, sorry. Um, just decided to do something on its own. Um, all the way to the final. And um, by having us at the beginning all the way through, then there's a clarity of, uh, and it's not being handed off to another vendor that is trying to make sense of it and um, having to make up stuff and then it's starting all over and the director is unhappy because it's like, well, that's not the design I, I you know, chose. It's like, why does it look different? So this process is something that we've uh, been able to do at ASC and, you know, and I think it, it helps the keep the, the cost down because there's not a lot of like, you know, um, extra cost of having to, to reinterpret something. Um, and here, this is just a little quick um, trailer or kind of in a way a commercial uh, aspect of what we do basically for sketch to screen. Sims Creative, a concept design and visual effects studio which has brought to life some of the most iconic film and television creatures of our generation. <laughs> ASC's sketch to screen workflow is unrivaled in its ability to seamlessly integrate elite concept design, pre-visualization and cutting edge visual effects to develop extraordinary creatures and worlds from script page to screen debut. examines the depths of a character, its role within the story, in the realization of look, feel, and emotion that are essential to the creation of memorable cinema creatures. Bringing these characters to life involves a series of carefully constructed digital assets that build upon meticulous designs, 3D models, and motion studies, pivotal to creating a lifelike life form. character, we are able to provide a cohesive glimpse into the conceptual world and before a single frame is ever shot, collaborating with costume designers to develop character wardrobe, production designers in the creation of props and weapons, 
and pivotal key scenes brought to life through storyboards and animatics. Our immersive sketch-to-screen workflow and award-winning design team combines the best of design and visual effects to transform your wildest dreams and nightmares into reality. Thanks. So this starts with uh, this. I'm going to break it down. Um, that kind of gave you an overview, um, but this is going to kind of be in a little bit more detail about that same phase. So we basically get a script, and so we start breaking down the script when it comes in. And um, a lot of times the script will just be very vague. You know, there's uh, sometimes like for um, um, uh, Stranger Things, it was uh, basically very minor, you know, l not really detailed information about the creature. You know, the, it was basically just, you know, some weird creature that eats people, and that was it. It doesn't really say that much. Um, but so then I asked the directors, I said, well, what do you, how do you see these, uh, these creatures? And they said, well, you know, I see them tall, lanky, with uh, maybe a lot of teeth, but no face. And I was like, wow, that's kind of challenging. Because um, you have to, you know, with a, a, you know, teeth, I guess you assume, I assume you have to have a face. But, um, but it was kind of an exciting challenge, and, um, and that also left us, you know, a lot of... Um, flexibility to do anything we wanted, which is uh, sometimes a lot of fun on projects that, um, you know, you have this flexibility because it's something that no one knows at this point, opposed to like an Incredible Hulk or, you know, another character that's so iconic that you have to fit within a box. This one, we actually had a lot of freedom. But I, um, getting back to this, <laughs> there's uh, this after the script phase, we end up, um, you know, looking through inspiration after we've had that conversation. And the inspiration comes from looking at, like, the Internet, you know, for the most part. And um, for this, you know, it, we put this together, sometimes only for ourselves, for the artist, and sometimes we'll give it to the client but, and kind of explain what we're thinking with each aspect of it. So the inside of uh, the, um, uh, the Demogorgon's mouth was based on this uh, snapping turtle. And um, snapping turtles, they have these weird membrane things. They're not necessarily teeth, but they look like teeth, and they're very intimidating. Um, but I had never seen anything on a creature that had all these teeth like in that, that form. So that was part of a, an earlier stage of designing, thinking about, you know, how that, those, the, when the mouth opened, all you would see was teeth, since its, its main job was to, to kill you and eat you. Um, the rest of it was like translucency of the skin. Maybe it had like, you know, the wrinkly skin that uh, looked baggy that, uh, and uh, the aspect of a mold being blind since there was no face. Um, so these are, this is kind of where it starts. Um, then we get into the conceptual phase. And from there, it's a lot of times it's just a sketch. You know, it's coming up with like an you know, overall look of, you know, really broad, you know, and simple sketches. And we'll do like hundreds of these just to kind of make sure that they're going in the right direction. Um, so we sent some of these out. The directors really said, hey, this is kind of interesting. Maybe flesh it out. Um, and it's, the thing is, some directors don't see sketches at all. They look at them and they go, I don't know what I'm looking at. It's like, it, is that what's going to look like is, you know, the final thing? And it's like, no, no, this is just a sketch. So um, we, uh, sometimes we won't even show it to the directors. Luckily, these directors could see a sketch and they uh, kind of, and I could guide them through it. And that's part of it, too, is really guiding, you know, somebody, you know, what you're thinking. It's not just give them a sketch or a design and say, what do you think? It's like always trying to give the thinking behind it um, and the uh, information of what you thought as a designer. So it, it ended up, now that we took it, we had a design, we started to build it in 3D and realize it, it was more of a com complete concept design. And um, it started off with, without the mouth being open, it was more like the mouth closed. So it was trying to figure out like what it would look like, you know, um, with the mouth open. And that's where we started getting into the, the, the teeth I had mentioned. I mean, you can see the similarity of the placement of the teeth from that uh, snapping turtle. And it's always great, you know what, uh, nature has so many, incredible things that, you know, uh, you and there's something, you know, when you see something that's real, that even though maybe not everybody's seen it, it feels real. It feels, you know, it's like there's a, this primal aspect because we identify with it because it opposed to making it up completely. There's this things about um, even the human body, you know, those are the things. So when this is in silhouette, it's like that just looks like some maybe weird, tall, lanky person in it, and it's very intimidating and scary, but we identify with it. And that's kind of important a lot of times in design, too, depending on the type of design you're doing. Um, 
So then we, uh, after designing the character, we, uh, we also design the character inside of a, a, an environment in a layout or, you know, a key scene. And that kind of helps, you know, uh, get the, uh, the idea across of what this character may be doing, how it may actually be functioning. Um, this is the scene, and you only saw it really from the back for the most part when it's eating an egg, um, which we, I still don't know what the egg is, but that's, that's still cool. Um, but from there we do these, the key scene layouts, which uh, is kind of like it's uh, kind of a, pro a, re a realized pre um, storyboard. So this is a scene that is basically the Demogorgon com coming out of a, a wall, and it had to come out of three different type of walls. The first one was uh, more like wallpaper, so my idea was to have it kind of papery and almost fleshy. Uh, then there's another one that where it comes out of a brick wall, so that was more cracked in pieces, and then the ceiling, which is more buckling. And So it was always thinking about what the material was. And uh, the, this whole thing in the story, was the fact when it p came out, then they came back and it, it had healed itself, like it, it was basically gone, except maybe there's some residue behind, you know. So this was to help illustrate that whole sequence so we can move forward in going into previs. Um, so from there, we get into the, like the modeling of the, the character and the creature. And so we use B ZBrush, obviously. It's the, uh, the tool of choice. Um, and so this is, you know, showing like just the process and the, uh, the close-up of the, the inside of the mouth, um, which was a lot of work to get all those teeth in there. Um, and then we do these, like, you know, after we have the model, we end up doing these turntables uh, to kind of see what does it look like, you know, from all different directions. Um, so this is, since we knew we were going to have to do a visual effect on this and we wanted to see what it looked like, it, how much spec is on it, how much... Uh, um, you know, uh, grittiness is, is on it and, uh, and get the approval from the director. Um, and now that we have this model, this is another part of this whole sketch to screen process, is that we also do this rapid prototyping, which is 3D printing. And so a lot of times, and in this particular project, we didn't have to do this, but this is a project, uh, a lot of times it uh, does come up. Um, we did this after the fact, after we designed it, but sometimes, and it was approved, um, because it didn't have to go through a whole pitch phase. But a lot of times, um, studios have to pitch a project. So when they pitch it, they um, having a 3D, uh, besides the paintings or the artwork that's digital, then they have a physical piece there that they can see, and, they, uh, and, uh, and they, their eyes light up. I mean, it usually it green lights a project, even if the script is crap, you know, for some reason, because they go, oh, my God, toys. Um, but I love the, the fact that, you know, again, now it's like going back to, like I said, with uh, Terminator, where I could, I could go back and touch, you know, something I create in the computer. And um, so this makes it, you know, one of those things that now we, it has many different purposes, but, uh, um, but we use it quite a bit for that pitching process. Um, so now that we have a model, we rig it, and we start getting into animation, and we go through these animation tests to see if, uh, oh, let me go back, I don't know why it's doing that. Um, so this is just, you know, kind of like to see how the body would bend or move, and so that's its dance move, which it never did in the show, but we thought it would be kind of fun. Um, but the animators, a lot of times, they'll try different, you know, animations, like a walk cycle, kind of, this was to kind of like, you know, a surprise look or something, like from the mouth closed, all coiled up, to opening up, because um, it was still, the script was being written when we were doing this. So some of it, we didn't know it would what it had to do. So it was kind of like going through all the motions. Um, then we get into the previs. And so this scene, and this is a little bit of previs and some R&D of like, you know, coming up with uh, how this, why is it doing that? Sorry, I apologize. Um, is how that wall may, uh, and this is like a low res version, but how it may actually break out of the wall. So this is like early, you know, kind of, conceptual um, previous test and uh, to get the approval from the from the directors is li is this the right going in the right direction before we actually commit a lot of man time to make this uh, you know time consuming and do all this sim and then they hate it and you have to start all over so you we're always like giving them pieces of the as we the progress as we're moving forward to get an approval with and get notes and this was a great project. I mean, there's not that many projects that are run this smooth. Right when the director saw this, is they were like, yeah, this is great. Just keep going, you know. But there's a lot of times that uh, directors will say, no, it's crap, and I don't know why. It's like, well, give us something. 
Um, then we get into the visual effects. So this is uh, kind of a, a break. Let's see if it will play. Um, so this just kind of breaks down like the layers and and what we did quite a bit on this too uh, is there's so many times that you let me go back sorry um, there's so many times in visual effects where um, things are kind of overbuilt when uh, when you're doing a TV show like this then a lot of times you don't have the time to do it like with the uh, you know uh, the way that you would do it for a feature film that had like you know a year this is a lot of times you know these were only weeks that we had to develop this stuff and my background being a, a practical is I end up trying to find out practical ways of doing things. So there was a lot of slime that these creatures had, and um, we ended up getting this stuff called ultra slime and wearing black gloves against a black background, and then filming all this different stuff where it was like stringing off and from all the different directions as we animated it. And uh, the compositors would use that to track in and, and um, create like the slime. And we were able to get like, you know, hundreds of different type of slime movements when it would take, you know, to simulate it and get it right would take so long. So cheats like that are things that I, we always try to come up with. And it's, they're also kind of fun to, you know, just get dirty and film something. Um, let's see. Then we get in, you know, the final visual effects where it's just kind of, this is kind of a little breakdown. Let me go back. So this just kind of shows, that, and this is again the same thing with the slime, where um, you know that slime was was added, and this was just you know one of the artists that was actually using his hand with slime and moving it in the same direction the mouth would open, and then the uh, compositor would track it back on. But it, with the time frame, that's it's very effective, and that's you know, and it's it was a way to do it because we actually at the same time had a sim artist doing it too, and it was taking way too long to get it right, and then. You know, the, the, the problem there is sometimes the director will say, well, no, it's not slimy enough, or it's, not, or it's too thin, or it's too thick, or whatever. And with this, we were able to do it just really quick. So cheats like that are always good to do. And, and this is just a breakdown of, like, you know, all the different layers. Um, then we get into um, ASC. Has it, besides it being a vendor, um, we actually are creating our own intellectual properties. And uh, that being... TV shows, uh, movies, games, um, our own our own IP that we can actually do something with and use our team to expand and create our own tel tell our own stories. Um, working with you know working in the industry for so many years, it's you know it's always been a passion to me to be able to tell my own stories. And now that I have you know a, an incredible talented team, visually we can tell these sh uh, stories uh, in even short burst. So one of them was this uh, short I did, which is archetype. Did this a few years ago, and um, and Fox picked it up. It was one that I ended up coming up with a story. This is just, I'm not going to show you the whole thing because it's too long. This is just a teaser, but um, but by having a group that actually can do the visual effects and do the designs and and execute it and go and actually go uh, to the f the full extent to show that we can actually do it as a as a company um, helps financiers and studios get interested in really putting some money behind it and seeing that there's possibly something they can create. So this is just a quick little um, teaser for this. Your identification code is RL7STV. You're a bipedal battle machine. So Archetype was um, um, just a short, and that was just a teaser for the short, and we ended up doing all this conceptual artwork and um, um, the other stuff that wasn't in the short that would help convey the idea of what the, f the feature could actually look like. So this is one of those things that I kind of learned in the hard way. Um, we pitched a, um, a project, and the studios actually came after us, you know, saying, wow, this is great. We want to make this into a feature. Is that what you're planning on doing with us? And I said, absolutely. And... Um, and uh, so they said, can you come in and pitch it? So the first uh, production company was Fox. And so I went in and pitched it with my producers and 
um, they loved the idea and they wanted to make the movie. And they said, we want to make this and we want you to be the director. And um, I said, this is great, but there's no feature uh, script. It's, it's basically, it's an idea, it's a short. And um, so we ended up hiring uh, some writers and they got intimidated with the idea because they were very junior writers. And the studios started talking about like, well, you know, maybe this shouldn't be about a robot. And I was like, well, that's what the short is about. And, uh, and it became one of these things that was going around and back and forth. And then some other robot films came out at that time while we were developing and they didn't do so well. Um, and so that kind of halted the, the, uh, the, f the film moving forward because of these, uh, like Robocop sequel didn't do well, I think Chappie, and there's a few other ones that were coming out and the studio got just cold feet. And, um, but what I did learn with this, and we're doing it now, is we develop, as we do these shorts, we do these ideas, these conceptual things, we actually have writers on board and have a feature script. So it was a great test um, for us to move forward with. Um, but now we have so many other cool projects that we're developing and it was a very uh, good learning experience for me. Um, some of those, this is uh, one that we're developing. It's a, a, a bounty hunter on Titan, Saturn's moon, him and his dog. It's kind of a, a Western, um, bit of road warrior Western kind of a thing. And uh, this is another one called Tethered Islands. It's uh, basically about how this uh, planet, and it's a lot like our planet, how we've destroyed our ecosystem and we can't live on top of it. We can't live on, on the planet itself, so we create these tethered islands that basically have ecosystems inside that pump oxygen back into the planet below. And then there's battles and wars happening just like there are on the Earth because people just can't get along for some reason. But, <laughs> but um, this one's in development. It's a big, fun sci-fi epic. Um, this is a, a, um, a comedy that we're working... Oh, geez, it went too far. Why did it do that? This is like not giving me the same thing over here. Um, embodied, uh, well, it goes back. Oh, there we go. Sorry. Tethered Islands. No. Uh, the Evils. The Evils is, is one that we're working on that's a, um, it's like the Munsters meets the Adams Family meets Modern Family. Uh, and uh, it's a, we come, it came up with our own mythology of these characters. And uh, they're, they're based, they're tree, tree based characters. So they're based on some kind of like, uh, opposed to like vampires or Wolfman or anything else. It's like, we wanted our own mythology with them. And it's all their story about going to New York to try to bring their uncle back to Romania. And, uh, and he won't leave. And so it's, it's, um, it's in the early stages of development, but we go through these, uh, you know, this is just the poster for it, but we shot a, a little teaser and we're doing the final edit on it right now and doing all the visual effects so we can go out and pitch the TV series. Um, Embodied is a, uh, is a project, it's uh, kind of a Thelma and Louise meets Alien, or Aliens, and, uh, but in Texas. So it's, uh, it's a kind of a fun project. It was one that was brought to me to um, try to fix. In a lot of ways it was a zombie film that was about these two women that had to fight off a zombie apocalypse in Texas. And, uh, no one, and zombies have kind of lost their interest, unfortunately. They've uh, kind of been uh, spent. So it was... Uh, one of those things that we needed to come up with something new. So they asked me, could you come up with something new with this? What would that be? I came up with, you know, uh, a different take on it. Not a, it was more of an alien take based on what we do to the environment. And so these uh, creatures are, are a, a virus that comes up through oil in Texas. And so it's, you go to Texas and that's all they have is oil. Um, so there's a, there's a lot to the story, but it's kind of fun. Now it's in that kind of stages right now where... Um, Lionsgate's very interested in making this as a feature. Mia Tash is a director. But this is kind of one of those that were, it's, it's a project that's co-produced co with you know, someone else that brought it to me, which we actually have a quite a few. These are just a few of the projects. Uh, and then the latest one is this one, which is my new uh, robot film uh, called Tank. And it's, um, we're doing a master class uh, at the end of March. And uh, we used uh, this as we're developing it to show this whole sketch to screen process. Um, go through the process from a sketch, from a, a script, all the way to from pre-production to production to post. And um, this story is uh, basically about you know it's a it's a it's almost like an Iron Giant story. It's a, a boy and his robot that protects him in the future. And um, we're developing, we're still finishing the the short. Um, but this is just a little. This doesn't have sound or anything like that because we don't have the sound yet. This is only the robot coming down to save the kid. So the kid right here is being attacked by. The drone, he's firing back, and then all of a sudden, this robot comes down, and you know, kind of, uh, we don't know his intention. Then all of a sudden, we see him kind of put his arm there and shield him from getting hit by the, you know, the drone, and then his weapon 
you know, shoots off something and avenge uh, and the, the drone goes down. But there's a whole beginning to this, too. So this whole thing we shot in L.A. and we built up this, you know, the background. Had like in L.A., there was, all, you know, the skyscrapers out there and we built them to be kind of slight in the future. Um, but this is kind of a fun, you know, a big robot, you know, kid film. But the, the idea um, is this robot protects him throughout the, the film. And so so um, the sketch to screen is is um, is our master class we're doing we're doing we're going to be highlighting um, all this the stuff that we talked about but it's also the process of like in the film industry all the things you have to deal with you know it's we're not going to be teaching anything about like how to use the software um, there's so many you know there's so many schools and uh, YouTube and it's more like the methodology the obstacles how you go overcome them and we're using um, uh, tank as you know kind of the the backdrop and then we'll be talking about all the other projects that had similar you know uh, problems throughout you know like when you're making a film um, and so s it will be kind of in this in the vein of going through everything from the design of the conceptual design of you know tank itself which we did like a, a bunch of different designs and show that and why this was chosen as the direction to go then the concept uh, uh, environment and character layout of just to kind of figure out the scale and made perhaps with the background maybe um, to you know the prop designs and building those and um, and going through that process to you know motion studies of uh, once we had the robot built and um, before we started texturing like how I w you know how would it walk you know we found a lot of problems in this as we were going and we talk about those problems you know that you know interpenetration of uh, things how do you overcome those you know for these uh, aspects of the leg, you know, penetrating part of the, the body. Uh, then we talk about, you know, tracking footage, you know, that, that process of what it takes to, to track that, the different technologies that's out there and the things to, to take care of when you're on production, on location. And, um, you know, and then, then just the kind of final, final VFX stuff that And then we get into uh, um, the you know so we'll be talking about all this so it's uh, pre-production, production, post-production, post and all these aspects of it. So that's the master class, which will be at the end of March. But you know, unfortunately, it's in Los Angeles. Uh, um, but we will be we will be uh, you know branching off and maybe come out here and do it here in Melbourne. Um, and so that's kind of the the uh, um, you know my my presentation. So uh, hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Yep. As you said, many directors could change their minds or have a completely different vision and not be present, but ho hopefully most will be when yeah. the process goes down. So what is the best way to keep communication between uh, well the well between the work uh, the people working and the one who wants the work and all the city I mean how do you keep communicating the best what is uh, your, your well way? it's a good question and and it's different on each pro project but um, the director usually has other uh, people around him like a production designer a visual effects supervisor and if he's not available the director then you, you communicate with them you know, you say, hey, these are, we're, we're, you know, we, this is what we talked about with the director. I want to make sure he's on the same page. And um, they usually try to figure that out, you know, like uh, help be that in between. Oh, yeah, it is, it is difficult um, uh, because there's a lot of times that um, they just, they, they'll change their mind for one or somebody doesn't agree with that. Uh, but what I tr we try to do is work closely with the director as possible always. So it's, so we, so that we know that at least that, you know, we're, we're getting it from his mouth and uh, not like a, another person in production that basically says, well, this is what I think he means, you know, because that can happen too where he's just interpreting an idea. Um, I'm not quite sure if that answers your question, does it? Yeah. It's hard to hear. I'm sorry. No interpretation. Just be clear about what you say and work close. That's what I'm getting from. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, as, l as long as, you know, you realize you're on the right path and um, and we always try to, you know, make sure that we show in stuff during the process and getting the approval. But there is a the, uh, few times where they change their mind. They basically, like, say, well, you know what? I was wrong. 
you know, if I if I do it like, you know, in a different way, you know, like a, an earlier design, and that happens quite a bit. I'm sorry. Hey. <laughs> um, so yeah, you it's it is one of those things. Film is organic and it does change, and it is hard to predict. And also, it even changes, and even sometimes it's even being written all the way to editing. I mean, even in editing, it's still in some ways being rewritten. So it's a. Uh, it's, it's sometimes a challenge, um, but you try to come up with as many solutions early on um, to overcome those possibilities. I hope that answers. Is it? Okay, it cool. Does, it does. Okay. Yes? When, when you showed us the turntable of the monster that you developed for uh, Stranger Things, uh -huh. uh, was that turntable also done in, uh, rendered in ZBrush, or did you bring the entire model to another software and assign the shader <coughs> or everything? Yeah, no, it, it is. It's brought into, for that, it was, uh, and a lot of times what we want to do is uh, render it in a pipeline that we're going to be rendering it in, which that was V-Ray. Um, uh, unfortunately, ZBrush doesn't really have a strong renderer. Yeah. And also, you don't, even if it did, it's not the way that we'd actually be rendering it if it did. It's like you're going to want to render it in the package that you're actually going to make it in um, and final it in. And that's, and it was Maya. Uh, so it was Maya with V-Ray. And um, we're starting to use Arnold as well, you know, on certain things. So it depends. But that particular one was V-Ray. Thank, uh -huh. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, well, it's staying like that. Maybe. I'll probably shave it. No, no, I, I have no idea. I'll do a, a, a mohawk. That's probably the next one. Yeah. <laughs> I need roller skates. <laughs> Hi. Um, Hello. Thank you for sharing everything that you have shared with us. Oh, yes, of course. And over all of the years and all the projects that you have worked on, what are the three main highlights that you can say these are at the pinnacle of w what makes me who I am today? Oh, that's interesting. Um, well, there's a, there's a few. I mean, it's uh, I think uh, Planet of the Apes is one of them. I mean, I had a lot of influence on that film from the beginning. Um, there's uh, uh, there was a lot of uh, you know m uh, me maneuvering certain things, and I felt like I had a lot to say and a lot to uh, show uh, with that and develop it. And also, just it's, I was such a fan of the original, so I do feel like that's a big um, part of my life. Um, and I learned a lot in the process. There's a few projects that I've worked with, and directors is where I really learned the most from a lot of times. Is, uh, one of them was Constantine, um, and it was uh, director Francis Lawrence. And um, I don't know if anyone you, uh, has seen the movie Constantine, um, uh, but it's, uh, it, ha it was you know, a character that has to go through hell and all that, so he wanted to try um, showing demons in a unique way. And I, my standard is to go demons with horns or anything else that we've seen. Um, but I wanted to go crazy with it and do something different. He was like, no, I don't want to see that. I want to see um, something that really, really disturbs me. And he explained what that was. And a lot of it was disease and a bunch of other things that um, disfigurement. So a bunch of things that make us uncomfortable and, and feel sympathy for. And, um, and I thought, well, this is interesting. That's a different take on it. So I ended up designing um, uh, Mammon, which was Satan's son, in that fashion. Um, and uh, with that, it became this, this aspect of right after that, it changed the way I designed. I started thinking about designs, and I ended up doing um, a whole line of characters uh, that were based on something similar to that that were almost these. Uh, and tomorrow in the demo, I'm going to go over a little bit of that and show those. And um, But yeah, that was a big turning point for me. A lot of times it is. It's a director. It's a filmmaker that basically guides you know, his vision and something I didn't think about. It makes me open my mind in a unique way.